I'm calling toward the August 23rd, 2016 uh, meeting of the Placer County Board of Supervisors. <laughs> I think we'll have a, a flag salute <laughs> led by Supervisor Durant. We'll now have our meeting procedures read. Welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors meeting of Tuesday, August 23rd, 2016. Agendas are available on the wall outside this meeting room. If you are here to speak on an issue not appearing on the agenda, you may do so during the public comment period. However, please note that the board is not permitted to take action on items addressed under public comment. All items on the agenda will be open for public comments before final action is taken. When you speak, clearly state your name for the record and be aware there is a three minute time limit per speaker. Keep in mind that the chairman has the discretion of limiting the total discussion time on any item. Please place all cell phones in silent mode. If you are hearing impaired, we have listening devices available. Thank you for your participation and cooperation. Thank you. Next is our consent agenda. This is a list of items that are recommended to be taken uh, together, but the board would be happy to uh, pull anyone to discuss it. If anyone, my colleagues wish that, or anyone from the audience would like something discussed individually. Is there a motion? So moved and seconded. Moved and seconded to approve the consent as is. Roll call, please. Duran? Yes. Holmes? Yes. Euler? Aye. Montgomery? Yes. Wygant? Yes. Uh, now is the time for public comment. This is the time when anyone from public can address the board on something that is not on the agenda, keep in mind that we can take no action. If someone has something, please come forward and state their name for the record. See none, we Hold will on. move. Hold on. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry. Good morning. We have someone Good from morning. Lake Tahoe. Yes, good morning, uh, Ellie Waller, Tahoe Vista resident. I would like to thank the Planning Commission for their recommendation to deny Martis Valley West. The commissioners asked good questions and de denied even with staff presenting otherwise. Um, I will be sending you detailed comments soon. That said, the Squaw Valley uh, Planning Commission didn't go quite as well and none of the same questions were asked with similar unavoidable um, and significant uh, impact. Um, as you know, uh, Michael Johnson retired uh, July 30th and now is a consultant for Mountainside Partners, um, assisting with the Martis Valley West specific plan. Um, I'm hoping that when, when you get before us on September 13th that you take in consideration um, that this is evidence of a revolving door of public-private partnerships and it is a perception of impropriety. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Placer County has any rules governing post-employment conflicts, especially with uh, the former planning director as being a consultant on a project that uh, some of the staff members that work for him um, were represented. Um, Michael Johnson is a member of the AICP, American Institute of Certified Planners. There is a code of ethics for those certified planners, and I have some concerns. I won't go into all of them, but there is one specific um, mention, number 25 in their code of ethics. We shall neither deliberately nor with reckless indifference commit any wrongful act, whether or not in the rules of conduct that reflects adversely on our professional uh, fitness. Maybe, since I have a, a minute here, I, I will say another one here. Um, there are some concerns about these rules of conduct um, for certified planners, which you need to take in consideration. We shall not accept an assignment from a client or employer to publicly advocate a position on a planning issue that is indistinguishably adverse to a position we publicly advocated for for a previous client within the past three years. We determine in good faith 
multi-factor consultation with qualified professionals that our ch change of position will not cause present detriment to other clients. Now, I know that the vote um, will be by your board after you hear all the considerations. I just have some concerns um, uh, about how this plays out uh, in the court of public opinion. Thank you. Is there, please state your name for the record. Ann Nichols, North Tahoe Preservation Alliance. Uh, good morning, supervisors. Um, maybe it's time for a reset, which would be with, we're gonna have a new planning director and, um, you know, I think that it's really important that the advice you get from your environmental consultants and from your county attorney uh, maybe aren't in such lockstep. For instance, uh, the 15 page, the Attorney General of California, Kamala Harris, took the time to write a 15 page letter of comment on Squaw Valley and it was just dismissed out of hand after the county attorney and Ascent Environmental uh, discussed it. And, and I'm not sure that the people of California would appreciate that. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, is it wise to hire Ascent on every project? And um, it just becomes a little bit too chummy, it seems to me. So in the future, maybe we could use other environmental uh, companies and um, I think it would be really appreciated it would help with public perception um, anyway thank you very much thank you is there anyone else up there I'd like to address the board no seeing uh, no one we will now uh, close public comment then and uh, go on to uh, sure, board I, committee reports Jack? I just had a comment on, sure. a, on, on those comments I think we're talking two uh, different issues here, having represented folks with professional licenses. I think there's a licensing issue from the planning, whoever licenses planners, you know, there's a licensing issue there. I think for the sake of the board, um, we should uh, ask legal counsel to give us some type of a uh, legal opinion as to the significance of, of that relationship. Um, obviously, that is a, um, a non disclosable legal opinion between you know between the board of supervisors but you know if the rest of the board feels that that uh, that should happen I would recommend that we at least get that so Jerry any comment uh, yeah I'll be happy to provide the board Great. with that thank you Jerry uh, now we'll go on to are there any uh, supervisor committee reports uh, Jennifer. Yes, if I may. Um, Supervisor Holmes and I had the opportunity last week to tour uh, a facility in Petaluma. Um, they're called COTS, which stands for the Committee on the Shelterless. Uh, really fascinating uh, operation that they have running. They've been uh, in place <coughs> since about 1988 and have, over time, um, created a, a very effective approach to um, addressing some of the issues around homelessness in, in Petaluma and um, I'm hoping to uh, get w together with uh, Dr. Oldham and put together a little bit of a quick white paper recap that we'll then submit to the board um, but just some very interesting things similarities differences but definitely some lessons learned that we could take away from them uh, but um, hoping Dr. Oldham and I can put something together for the whole board great thank you are there any other uh, check yeah I just wanted to um, report monthly um, SACOG meeting uh, and was approached by one of the supervisors from El Dorado County and um, there appears that there is a an issue with regards to the logging roads um, and apparently the loggers in plaster to get to the plaster side of um, of, uh, of the of the area in order to get logs that are either burned or or, or dead out um, there's been some damage to that particular road so uh, I've uh, asked uh, David to kind of look into, uh, as well as Public Works, uh, to kind of look into what we can do as far as assisting El Dorado County to repair the road, whether it be some type of a, uh, a payment or maybe using some of our resources jointly to, to take care of that, so. Good. Any other supervisor committee reports? 
seeing none, well, that will take up our uh, first timed item, 910, and it's a presentation by Supervisor Holmes, maybe in collaboration with his brother, I'm not sure. No. But to uh, Betty Sampson uh, for an award of merit uh, from the Conference of California Historical Society. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's my great honor to uh, present this uh, award to Betty Sampson. Uh, what I'd like to do is read uh, some of the uh, nomination submittal that uh, Michael Otten sent to the uh, committee. <clears throat> Betty R. Sampson is not only a World War II and Korean War heroine for her home front activities at McClellan Air Force Base. For the last 29 years, she has been the ears, eyes, and voice of the Placer County Historical Society. <clears throat> when she turned Ryanie last, she, she, she said, she realized it was time to announce she was going to make her last roundup of guests for the Placer County Historical Society dinner meetings. Over nearly three decades, she has regularly called members to remind them of the dinner, to send in their checks, and tend the guest table with name tags at every dinner. Over the years, as a board member, she regularly chaired the nomination committee recruiting officers and board members in the Oral History Committee. Mrs. Sampson was a faithful representative at many of our historical marker dedications and museum exhibit openings. For much of the same period, she also served on the board of the Placer County Historical Foundation, primarily to raise funds for historical preservation. Her often behind the scenes enthusiasm, directness, which I have been a recipient of, <laughs> perseverance and loyalty has been a major force in keeping the historical society and historical foundation going. Often nicknamed B1 Betty by her friends, she is among those remembered at the 145 acre Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront National Historical National Park, which, is, which was established in 2000 in Richmond, California. She is not only the darling of veterans organizations, she served as a treasurer of the Placer County Taxpayers League. She is, she is chauffeured in an army Jeep in the annual Auburn Veterans Day Parade. Her depression area values and the patriotism of the United States citizens during World War II remain with her until this day. In her Rosie, Rosie the Riveter oral history, she said as a kid in the 1930s, she really didn't think of herself as being poor as there was always food from the garden and things to do. So it was probably natural for her because her father was an auto mechanic, an admiral trade I will tell you, that in her senior year at Grant Union High School in Del Paso Heights, she took a course in aircraft mechanics. It served her in good stead because right after graduation in January 1943, she went right to work in assembling engines for the war effort at nearby McClellan Air Force Base. <clears throat> her home was on the patrol line of the base. She had her own horse and saved enough to buy her first car. By 1945, Betty met a cowboy, Stanley James Jim Sanson, through a roping class they were involved in where she roped and tied him and forced him to marry her. No, that, that, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. <laughs> they were married on October 26, 1946 in Carson City, Nevada. Call Betty a hard scrabble cowgirl who served her country and serviced some of its wartime bombers and fighter jets during World War II and the Korean conflict. She continues to serve in the preservation of history and avoiding wasteful spending in government. Thus, we at the Placer County Historical Society think she is a worthy candidate for an award of merit from the Conference of California Historical Societies. And I have this award of merit and I want to come down and present it to you.
Uh, Jennifer, gentlemen, thank you for giving the Historical Society and myself time on the agenda. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, it's been an honor to accept this award. In the Historical Society community, it's a pretty prestigious award. And I'd like to thank Michael Otten, who was with our president for 10 years, and George Lake, who was our president for 10 years, and the rest of my, my family, and Mike and Helma, uh, <laughs> my, <coughs> for coming in. Uh, I'd like to thank the Placer County Historical Society Board for nominating, or for, for this, and also the foundation, and uh, Mayor Bill Kirby, too, for his, for his letter of commendation. And thank you. Thanks, Betty. <laughs> thank you, and congratulations, Betty. Betty, I wanted to take the opportunity to say a personal thank you. Um, I think your and my relationship is less through the Historical Society and more through veterans' events. And um, I'm, I'm delighted that, that uh, Supervisor Holmes brought this honor for you forward today. And uh, I look forward to working with you on many more veterans' events for many, many more years. So while you may be uh, phasing out some of the work you do with the Historical Society, you better hang out on all this veteran stuff with me because I need a good role model. Thank you. Okay, we will now uh, take up our first department item, administrative services procurement. Um, John. First item is the award of purchases to California Governor's Office of Emergency Services uh, for 34 Chevrolet Tahoe patrol vehicles. Good morning, Super Chairman Wygant, Supervisors. My name is Brett Wood, I'm your purchasing manager, and item 4A is a request to approve a negotiated purchase order with the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services for public safety vehicles. This is currently for 34 Tahoe, Tahoe patrol vehicles and eight non-patrol vehicles for both the probation office and the or probation department and the sheriff's office. We're also requesting at this time that if additional vehicles are added to the master fixed asset list, then we would have the authority to purchase those for the sheriff's office and the probation department, subject to your board's approval. The reason that we've selected, or the reason that we're recommending utilizing this program at this time is because the department has requested an expedited delivery because going through a normal bidding process, we would not, if uh, the Cal OES program, the 1122 program being recommended, was the ultimate winner, and we go through a normal bidding process, it would take us an additional six to eight weeks before we would be in front of your board, which would delay the order and subsequent delivery for the departments. These vehicles, if ordered now through this cooperative program, will be here probably by the end of October, which will allow the department to implement those vehicles sooner into service. Um, with that, happy to stand for any questions, and we have representatives from the probations department and the sheriff's office here if you have additional questions. Thanks. Uh, any questions from board members? See none. Anyone from the public wish to address this item? It's the pleasure of the board. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. And then next, um, uh, uh, authorized purchase manager sign all required documents to uh, purchase. That's that, that's all taken care of, right? So yeah, yeah I apologize. So let's go to our 920 timed item, which is Health and Human Services Proclamation declaring sep sep September as the Hunger Action Month. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Ryan Frednick. I'm the CalFresh and General Relief Program Manager for the Human Services Division of Health and Human Services in Placer County. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Wigan and the board for uh, allowing us this proclamation. Um, if you mind, don't mind, I'd like to read the proclamation now. You bet. Okay. Um, whereas Feeding America has designated the month of September as Hunger Action Month, and whereas hunger and poverty are issues of grave concern in the United States, the state of California, 
and Placer County, and whereas the Feeding America Map the Meal Gap 2016 report has identified more than 45,000, or 12.6% of individuals in Placer County as food insecure individuals based on 2014 data, and whereas food insecure represents individuals who must make difficult choices of whether to buy healthy food or pay for rent or utilities, and whereas Placer County is committed to raising awareness of hunger needs so that citizens, businesses, and the county can work together to reduce hunger, and whereas Placer County deems it beneficial to support all efforts to educate citizens in nutrition and to encourage healthier eating, and whereas the county recognizes the efforts of the Placer Food Bank and the numerous hunger relief organizations throughout Placer County who are dedicated to providing groceries to families in need, whereas food banks and food closets across the county will host events and activities throughout the month of September to bring awareness and attention to the issue of hunger and encourage the involvement of our community to help solve hunger. Now therefore, be it proclaimed that the Placer County Board of Supervisors does hereby declare September 2016 as Hunger Action Month in Placer County and encourages all its citizens and businesses to support efforts to reduce hunger in our community. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that forward. Um, any comments or questions by board members? Anyone from the public wish to address this item? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the board? Move approval. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Please come forward. Appreciate it. Um, hello, everybody. Um, Chairman Wigan, thank you, and Board of Supervisors. My name is Dave Martinez. I'm the Executive Director of Placer Food Bank. And we are very fortunate in Placer County, we have a Feeding America Food Bank that covers three counties, Placer, El Dorado, and Nevada County. And I am that Executive Director. September is Hunger Action Month when we ask everyone in America to take action against the fight of hunger in their community. Hunger Action Month is your opportunity to join a movement that has a real and lasting impact on our effort to feed more Americans. Whether it's by advocating, raising awareness, making donations, or volunteering, individuals can find a way that's right for them to make a difference during Hunger Action Month. It is staggering to think that in Placer County, nearly 10 years after a recession, we still have 45,000 individuals that are food insecure. This proclamation brings us one step closer as a community that we can solve this problem. On September 10th, from 2 to 4 p.m., Placer Food Bank will open its doors to the public for our national community open house, where we'll have a variety of uh, activities for all ages, families, and to volunteer to help make a difference. I'd also like to uh, share that in Auburn here, and, uh, and, and I'd actually like to take a moment to uh, bring recognition to Sandy Bassett and the Auburn Interfaith. In Auburn, the Auburn Community Service Day will sponsor the Auburn Community Food Drive. On September 17th, grocery bags will be distributed to homes in the Auburn area, and then on September 24th, those donations will be picked up. This food drive will benefit Auburn Interfaith and Salvation Army. Again, another way our community rallies together to help solve hunger in our community. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to come and make the presentation. Appreciate it. Okay, we'll take up our next uh, department item, which is Public Works uh, Countywide Projects Plan Specifications for Job Order Contracting. And Rob, I think you're going to present that to us. Morning, Chairman Wygant, members of the board. Rob Unholz, Capital Improvements uh, Program Manager with Public Works and Facilities. Today, we're requesting that your board approve plans and specifications for job order contracting project number 9486.05 with an estimated probable construction cost not to exceed $2.2 .2 million, including contingency and staff, uh, and authorized staff to ad advertise for bids. This represents moving into our sixth year of utilizing job order contracting. The, this past year, we have contracted with Pride Industries and Auto Construction. Their contracts will expire October 14th and 28th, respectively. We have successfully utilized Jock to deliver a number of projects, including welcome center improvements, garden theater sidewalk replacement, emergency roof replacement at buildings 110 and 111, modifications to the South Placer Adult Correctional Facility, 
uh, which included booking and holding, minimum security, and uh, floor uh, issues in the kitchen, as well as the clerk of the board, board of supervisors remodeled its uh, nearing completion here. The JOC contract is an indefinite quantity contract based on construction task catalog established by the Gordian Group <clears throat> and adjusted for our construction market for labor and materials. Contractors will bid adjustment factors for geographic location, security conditions, as well as normal and non-normal business hours, working hours. The scope of work will be determined by the county and the contractor will develop a responsive proposal based on tasks, quantities, and the appropriate adjustment factor. A job order will be issued based on acceptable, an acceptable and responsive proposal. The minimum contract for each contractor is contract value is $50,000. The estimated maximum value is $1 million. And the county reserves the right to increase the maximum contract value that is currently authorized by the public contract code of $4.1 million. Upon your board's approval, plans and specifications will be bid, and staff will return for, your, for award to the two lowest responsive and responsible bidders. The estimated total project cost is $2.2 million. Funding for this is included in the fiscal year 2016-17 uh, capital projects fund budget. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Rob. Any questions from board members? I see none. Anyone from the public wish to address this item? I see none, none there either. Uh, pleasure of the board. Moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thanks, Rob. Okay, our next uh, department item is uh, Bowman Road Bridge Rehabilitation. Kevin. Nope, not Kevin. Kevin's there too. Oh, jeez. <laughs> We're both here. Uh, Matt Randall, Senior Engineer with Public Works and Facilities. Good morning. Um, this item, we're asking you to adopt a resolution authorizing the Director of Public Works and Facilities, or his designee, to enter into a public highway overpass crossing agreement with Union Pacific Railroad for the Bowman Road at Union Pacific Railroad Bridge Rehabilitation Project for an amount not to exceed $475,186. So this project includes um, a bridge rehabilitation and uh, some, we're building some sidewalks along the, uh, the west side of the bridge and then some seismic retrofit work down below the bridge and Union Pacific uh, right away. And um, your board approved a previous agreement in 2011 which covered the pre-construction work, um, all of the work to develop the plans and basically lead up to this agreement which allows us to go into construction next year. And this agreement covers um, our rights of entry, our right of way needs to get down into UP right away, um, as well as flagging Union Pacific costs to review our documents and submittals, um, and then also to build a, uh, a safety guardrail for the, uh, the railroad itself. Um, so as I mentioned, this, this is needed for construction. This uh, agreement's been reviewed and approved by County Council, Risk Management, and Caltrans as well. Um, and this uh, agreement is also entirely funded with federal aid over uh, within this federal fiscal year or this our county fiscal year and next year as well. So with that, I just open it up to any questions. Thanks, Matt. Any questions by board members? Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Matt. Appreciate sure. you bringing this forward. I know that bridge has been in need of some love yes. for a while. Um, that is a fairly heavily used road. Do we have any idea what the duration of the project will be and, yeah. and what the impacts will be? Road closures, right. single laning? Right, so what we're thinking for that is we're gonna close the road and detour traffic. The, the detour actually um, is fairly convenient because we're planning to use I-80. Okay. Um, and so that's, that's the main thing. Um, we're thinking between six and eight months of construction um, one of the things that uh, I know we've reached out to the school, the adjacent school, if the, um, if the project runs into the school year, we're talking, one of the, the final things we're, we're talking about doing is having some sort of uh, away from the construction. We want to keep, keep the kids out of construction, so we're trying to keep the construction out of the school year. But if it goes into the school year, routing them around the, the construction through the site. And so I think bottom line is we're trying to work out all the issues here at the end and um, I know we're going to go back to the school one more time and also to the, uh, the North Auburn MAC. 
So. Okay. Does that answer? Uh, yeah. it, it does. I'm, I'm pretty sure with a six to eight month construction time frame, we are going to be on one end or the other, if not both of the school year. So we should make sure we, right. uh, Oh yeah, for okay. sure. And then I would also just suggest that we do some, um, additional outreach to the folks that there's a veterinary clinic there. I'm sorry. I'm not remembering the name of it. Um, on old airport, I think, right. Yeah, Is exactly. that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then also, um, to Machado's, uh, summer particularly is a very busy time for them right so we may need to do a little bit more okay to them. sure and I'd be absolutely happy, yeah happy to help with any of that okay thank you uh, Kirk you're anticipating construction from when to when we're well <laughs> it depends on our authorizations with Caltrans but right now we're thinking um, of advertising in the spring and then starting construction early summer uh, May June and then six months from that would be our, our best case scenario. Okay. Then I'll just add one other group to Jennifer's list of notifications. Okay. If you're in May, the Auburn Triathlon runs in right. May. And that's okay, no, that's good, yeah. For the okay. Auburn Triathlon, so just so you work. Good stuff, yeah. yeah. See, I think food is itemized. He thinks no, that's fine. <laughs> it's all it important, really well. for sure. Um, anyone from the public wish to address this item? Seeing none, pleasure of the board. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And Matt, you're doing the next one also? I No. The this one you get Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it right next time. Kevin. To uh, consideration of purchasing two motor graders. Yes, sir. Kevin Tabor, Department of Public Works and Facilities, Engineering Manager for Road Maintenance Division. Um, yeah, just with this next item, asking your approval. Um, to award the negotiated purchase order for two motor graders um, that will replace two 1980s vintage Clark motor graders. Initially, they'll be used in the Serene Lakes area for snow removal um, and then around the county throughout the year as, as needs arise. Um, it, the, the graders are in the master fixed asset list for this current um, year's budget and we have the funds to pay for them. So with that, I'll answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Jennifer. And um, what's going to happen to the old motor graders? Good question. We'll, we'll, um, put them in the museum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe something with Pokemon go, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> which is happening at the pool grader in the corner. I wouldn't first, I know firsthand. Um, th we'll, we'll surplus them. We'll send them to auction and, um, depending on their air pollution, carb status, they will, um, as a matter of fact, I, I should mention that these graders are partially funded through an air pollution control grant. Um, so I stand corrected. Those, we're, we're going to put a bullet in them. They're, okay. They won't be surplused and sold at auction. They will be scrapped. OK, thank yes. you. Thank and you. thank you as well for going above and beyond the call of duty and attending a, a weekend meeting on snow removal this last <laughs> weekend. So I appreciate that. It was a good time. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, anyone from the public wish to address this item? Seeing none. Move approval. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. We'll now go to our 930 timed item, which is a presentation by uh, Ag Department. Ed, uh, King is going to kick this off regarding uh, coexisting with urban beavers. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Good morning. Ed King. Deputy Act Commissioner and liaison to the County Fish and Game Commission. At the Commission's July meeting, they heard a presentation on urban beaver conservation from Ms. Heidi Perriman, who is the founder of a group called Worth a Dam based in Martinez. This was an informational item on the Commission's agenda. No action was taken. Concerned citizens have suggested that your board also hear a presentation uh, from Heidi, so she's with us here today. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me, and um, Jack is going to give you a little introduction. My name is Jack Sanchez. I'm with Save Auburn Ravine Salmon and Steelhead, and I want to thank uh, Robert and uh, the board, uh, Jennifer and the gentlemen, and especially Supervisor James Holmes for setting this uh, dynamic talk up uh, so that uh, Dr. Perryman could uh, talk to you folks. Heidi has become the nation's foremost 
beaver specialist as a result of a beaver family moving into Martinez Creek in the front of a Starbucks and producing kits. She started Worth a Dam and has spread the beneficial aspects of beavers and waterways worldwide. Placer County allowed housing development too close to its waterways and an adversarial relationship has developed with beavers and they have suffered mightily. I personally believe if the English and Russians and beaver trappers had not exterminated beavers in California in the 18th and 19th century, centuries, we would have no need for the billion dollar rim dams such as Shasta, Folsom, and Oroville for water storage because the beavers would have naturally stored California's water. I present uh, with great pleasure Dr. Heidi Perryman on beavers. Thank you, Thank you very much. Now I'm going to talk with you today about a comeback kid that people are not always happy to see. Um, and you all know that since the fur trade pretty much wiped out the beaver population in California, it's been creeping back. So it is not uncommon to have beaver issues arise all across California and, ca and counties, and not the least of which in Placer County. Placer County received depredation permits at a rate seven times greater than anywhere else in the state in the last couple of years. And obviously depredation solves a problem for a little while, but it doesn't solve it forever. And as the population has recovered, uh, new beavers are just more likely to move in to that adequate habitat and generally can do so within the year. Uh, I thought I would talk with you about a way a city did this differently and the cost savings that we saw in my hometown of Martinez, California. Now Martinez is 40 miles northeast of San Francisco. It's the hometown of John Muir. It's right on the Carquinez Strait. And the creek where the beavers moved in 2007 flows right through town, right through Main Street. And the city was concerned because the beavers built a dam. Obviously, they thought this dam was going to exacerbate the risk of flooding in an area that was already prone to flooding. So they responded pretty immediately and typically by getting a permit to depredate the beavers. But as it happened, these were fairly easy to see beavers. So all the children on the way to school, all the lawyers on the way to the courtroom could stand on the bridges and see these beavers. And in fact, people got pretty engaged with them. And they got curious, isn't there some way other than depredation to restore our creek, save the flooding problem, and keep the beavers in the area? Uh, they did a lot of research. There was a lot of controversy on the issue because businesses were concerned about their property value. And uh, the media did a lot of reporting on the controversy. And we were hopeful that all this attention was going to slow the city council down. Now, there was a big meeting to discuss the fate of the beavers. Um, 200 people showed up for that meeting in person. And they came from uptown, downtown, and out of town. And they said, we don't want you to kill our beavers. We want you, our city leaders, to figure out a different way to do this. It was a pretty amazing meeting. There was massive public outcry. And the city, faced with what, they've, what they didn't expect, did what cities often do, which is to appoint a subcommittee to study the issue further. Now, I was on that subcommittee. We had 90 days to solve the issue of what it would cost and how it would work if we were to consider having beaver in an urban area. And the first thing we did was address the issue of dam height and dam safety by hiring this gentleman. This is Skip Lyle. He's the inventor of the beaver deceiver. And we brought him out from Vermont, and he installed a flow device. Now, the way a flow device works is it moves the water from upstream to downstream, and it does it in such a way that the water loss is disguised from the beavers. Um, since this was installed in the very first days of 2008, 
Nobody in Martinez has worried about flooding from beavers. This entirely solved our problem. And since the beavers stayed in the area, that meant that they kept all the other beavers away. So we fixed this once for the last decade. Uh, since the Martinez City was a test case back in 2007, it is much more common for cities to use these solutions. And in fact, there are experts trained in California, so you don't need to hire somebody from Vermont to do this. There is also a DVD to teach landowners to do this work themselves. And that way you're just paying for parts. Um, this is something that has really changed in the last 10 years. Our beavers were very good sports. They decided to stick around. They eat cottonwood. They eat willow. They eat cattails. They eat tule. They eat blackberries. The trees that you want to protect, you can wrap with wire. Not chicken wire, because beavers are way bigger than chickens. But it's also important to remember that beaver chewed trees are going to coppice if you leave their roots in the ground. Coppice is an old forestry term, which means to hard cut back a tree so it grows back bushy and more dense. And you've all done this in your garden. What the research shows is that coppicing occurs and it creates natural habitat for, for migratory and, and nesting songbirds. Um, this means that as the number of beavers go up, the number of birds go up too. Other trees that you want to protect, you can paint with sand. And what you're doing is choosing a latex paint that matches the color of the bark uh, and adding mason sand to the mix. This creates a gritty texture the beavers don't want to chew. Generally, this is much cheaper and less obtrusive, but it has to be repeated every two years for maximum results get some Boy Scouts and a pizza party, I'm thinking. Uh, the other big concern that Martinez had was population. Beavers are obviously rodents. Did that mean we would have an explosion of beavers in our creek? But it turns out beaver populations grow really slowly and predictably. They can mate only once a year. They're very territorial, so no other beavers come in. And the beavers that are born, when they get to be two years old, they have to go off and seek their own fortune, get their own habitat. It has to be at least two miles away. So that means that even though we've had 24 kits born in Alhambra Creek in the last decade, we, our population has never exceeded seven. And that made people feel a little less anxious at Martinez. Also, since the beavers were doing their naturally territorial behaviors, no other beavers came. So we solved our problem once, and it lasted for 10 years. Now, beavers are a keystone species. They have a disproportionate effect on the environment, and we've really seen that firsthand in Martinez. What they do is their dam traps sediment and organic material. This gets broken down by tiny bugs that you can't see, which get eaten by bigger bugs that you can see. But it's also important to remember that beavers are working mud often, and that really creates an invertebrate bloom. That means everything that eats those bugs and everything that comes to eat the things that eat those bugs does better at a beaver pond. We've really observed this firsthand in Martinez, where all these pictures are from in our urban creek. Uh, it's been our, our birds have improved, our wildlife has improved, our pond turtle population has improved, and we've even have a yearly beaver festival, which I can't say happens in every city. Um, I love this photo in particular because you can see the water is so thick with fish that when this beaver pushes up to work on the dam, he actually gets a fish on his eye. Now, people are often very interested in the discussion of beavers and fish. Uh, won't beaver dams block the anadromous fish, the steelhead and the salmon, from getting back from sea? But it's important to remember these two species co-evolved, and the research out of NOAA in the last 20 years is very clear that not only can salmon navigate beaver dams most of the time, but they also really rely on beaver ponds to grow up and to overwinter safely. 
So that's one of the reasons Jack was so happy about my coming to talk with you today. It's because he's so interested in what beavers can do for a salmon and steelhead population in your creeks. I like this slide in particular. It's from Michael Pollack in, in the NOAA Fisheries that's been doing the majority of this work. And you can see the difference in smolt, baby salmon, from a beaver pond versus large woody debris pond. It's really quite staggering. The food difference is really um, creating a dramatic effect. Now, it is not just the biodiversity effects that we should consider beaver value for, but there are also a host of abiotic effects, including removal of nitrogen, removal of phosphorus, removal of suspended solids. These are all reasons why cities should be considering the idea of coexisting with beaver. Now, um, I'm ready for all of California to do that, but before I could step up to the plate in that way, I had to deal with California's 70-year-old mistake. And the 70-year-old mistake really starts with the gentleman in the corner. That's Joseph Grinnell. He was the original director of vertebrate zoology at UC Berkeley. And he published some volumes that said very clearly beaver didn't exist and weren't native in California over 1,000 feet and in the coastal rivers. Now this didn't make sense to me or to a lot of beaver thinkers, and we were very happy to connect with an archeologist from the Bureau of Land Management who came across a beaver dam in a carbon, in a excavation he was doing for the Bureau of Land Management, and he had the sense of mind to actually carbon test three elements of wood in that, the lowest part of the wood carbon tested out as continuously maintained since 580 AD. And that really gave us the platform we needed. This is the Sierras. This is where Grinnell said they couldn't be, but they obviously were. We really tried to re-examine the research, looking at native information, looking at tribal languages, looking at trapping accounts, looking at historic publications of all kinds. And we were able to publish three papers in the Journal of Fish and Game about beaver and where it belonged historically. And basically, the I'd be happy to get you copies of those papers if you want them. Um, beaver belonged everywhere in California except for maybe the Mojave Desert. And during wet years, it probably got there as well. And, and that really was helpful. Now, since the early days of the fur trade, uh, fur trapping is no longer the biggest threat to beavers. The biggest threat is depredation. And depredation really has to do with there's an animal doing something you don't want on your property, and you get a permit from Fish and Game to exterminate it. Uh, we reviewed all the depredation permits for California in the last three years. And we're surprised to find that Placer County in particular is receiving depredation permits at a rate seven times higher than any county in the state. That is significant at the .02 level, and it, significant, it maintains significance even when we controlled for things like population density or water acreage. Uh, this matters not only because of the beavers, it matters because when you're removing a beaver population, you're actually removing all the ecosystem services that beaver dam provided. And it matters for your fish and your wildlife and your birds and your stream quality as well. Uh, the most common problem that people seek depredation permits for is damage to landscaping, eating trees or rose bushes or whatever. Uh, this is a very easy problem to solve with a very little bit of education. And I really hope that um, Martinez can help uh, communicate that information. Now, the answer to a lot of issues that California is facing are really beaver-shaped, I, I think. Uh, cal beavers make a significant difference to water storage which really would help us with our low snowpack in the Sierras and water acreage all around. In fact, beavers are reintroduced 
for water storage in other states, but not in California. Um, I started the organization Worth a Dam because I wanted to advocate for the Martinez beavers, but also to teach other cities how and why to live with beavers. We won the Conservation Award from the John Muir Association this year, and um, we hold a yearly beaver festival in August. Next year will be our 10th, and you're all invited. Beavers really are how the West was watered and how it can be again. So I'm Heidi Perryman. I know that beavers are worth a damn, and thank you so much for letting me talk with you about it today. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any comments or Jim? <coughs> Thank you so much for this uh, informative presentation. Do beavers have a natural predator? Is there any species that, well, um, besides human beings? Bobcats, mountain lions, coyotes, all very, we get in wolverines back in California, yeah. so they love beavers. Oh, okay. But also um, there are natural parasites that can cause beaver death. We had several beavers die from um, roundworm parasite, oh. which, which is quite common. And uh, where are the, the most, which part of Placer County are the most depredation permits? Um, in 2014, the winner was Loomis. And in 2013, I think it was Auburn. And uh, there has been a, a proliferation of beavers over the last, since it's called, you are talking about urban beavers. Is yeah. There been a proliferation? Well, I think the population is recovering. Uh -huh. So it's not at all a new, like, when Martinez got our beavers, people acted like it was a big surprise. But now it's not a surprise anymore. Beaver, urban beaver issues happened in 38 states across the country last year. And do you think that's part of because uh, we've done a lot of building in areas and there's runoff from, say, the the Well, you know, we had a meeting with Fish and Game, and one of the things we talked about was that at when redevelopers were building out and they were removing trees, one of the ways they were recovering those trees, which they had to recover, was planting on the riparian, oh. which is obviously a big dinner bell for right. a beaver. Okay. So um, that seemed to be something that Fish and Game thought was significant. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Jennifer. Dr. Perryman, thank you uh, for your time. I've heard your presentation before, um, and um, we've had some other presentations on uh, beaver-human uh, coexistence, uh, particularly up in the Tahoe area, and I think it was very educational for us. This was, gosh, I think four or five years ago. Yeah, I think it was Placer County. It mm -hmm. was, um, no, excuse me, it was the Sierra Wild Fish and Wildlife Commission, and we gave, A not presentation. Fish and Wildlife Commission, I'm sorry, the Sierra Wildlife Coalition. Exactly. Yes, we gave them a scholarship for the work that they did up there originally. Exactly. That's, and yeah. uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out is that um, while we don't often think of Tahoe as urban, it is actually pretty urban. It's lot and block developments with sort of most of the amenities you would expect with urban life. Uh, but people strangely have a vision of it as very rural, but then when faced with rural activity, like yeah. beavers, um, often want the county to step in to somehow intervene. Right. And uh, what was incredibly useful to us in the conversation we had was helping identify for homeowners the steps that they should be taking. Mm -hmm. um, because frankly, the, the last uh, the last step in this process to take is depredation. I mean, that is certainly not something any of us want to do. And I think the important thing to take away from this today is there are a lot of very effective and positive ways to deal with the negatives that we see uh, with co cohabiting. I'm not going to say cohabitating because that sounds wrong uh, with beavers. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I, I would like to see us not be number one in the state of California, <laughs> certainly as it relates to beaver depredation. So thank you again for your time. I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, is anyone from the public interested in speaking this item? Thank you. We'll now take up our uh, next department item, which is human resources and risk management. Uh, which is to uh, word the job order for human resources risk management remodel at 145 Fullweiler Road, Rob. And also authorize the Director of Public Works to uh, execute the agreement. 
Again, good morning, Chairman Wygant, members of the board, Rob Unholst, Capital Improvements Program Manager for Public Works and Facilities. Today we're requesting that your board award the job order for the remodel of the Fulweiler Administrative Building at 145 Fulweiler <coughs> to John F. Otto Incorporated Auto Construction in the amount of $413,579.55. And authorize the director of public works and facilities or designee to execute said job order and approve any supplemental job orders consistent with the county purchasing manual and section 20142 of the public contract code on august 18th 2015 your board awarded a job order contract to auto construction the job order contracts exceeding two hundred and fifty thousand dollars uh, require your board's approval. On February 23rd, 2016, your board approved an agreement with Lyonakis for architectural and engineering services for the remodel of the Fulweiler Administrative Building. The work includes remodeling and improvement of three of the existing five occupancies, including human resources, general liability, and risk management, and the addition of library administration. The improvements include converting the second floor human resources training room to offices and workstations, remodeling of the second floor lobby. It also includes creation of a new training room on the first floor and the remodel of the first floor office space to accommodate risk management and the addition of the director of library services and five library administration staff. Auto construction has submitted a complete and responsive proposal based on the construction documents and specifications and the jock construction task catalog. The estimated total project cost is 756623 which includes design, contingency, project management. Um, and funding is provided in the fiscal year 2016. 17 capital projects fund miscellaneous projects project number 4907 in order to proceed it's requested that your board award the job order for the remodel of the Fulweiler administration building to, to auto construction in the amount of four hundred and thirteen thousand five hundred seventy nine dollars and fifty five cents authorize the director of public works and facilities or designee to execute said job order and approve any job order any supplemental job orders consistent with the county purchasing policy and section 20142 of the public contract code. Be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Rob. Any questions? I see none. Uh, any questions or comments from anyone in the public? See none there either. Pleasure of the board. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the just discussed job order and authorize the public works director to sign that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Rob. Our next department item is roadway sign uh, safety audit and sign upgrade. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Wygant and board members. Phil Vashon with the Department of Public Works and Facilities. Uh, here to ask you today to adopt a resolution to approve amendment number two to Professional Services Agreement number 1197 with Kimley Horn and Associates for Engineering Services for the Roadway Safety Sign Audit and Sign Upgrade Project uh, for an additional amount of $43,000 to increase the total PSA amount not to exceed 413,922 and authorize the Director of Public Works and Facilities to execute future contract amendments not to exceed $50,000. Um, back on April 23rd of 2015, your board approved PSA number 1197 with Kimley Horn for engineering services for the roadway safety sign audit and sign upgrade project. Um, this project includes the uh, audit of 62 county roadway signs on 62 county roadways encompassing about 175 miles. So it's a big sign project and you're talking uh, upwards of a thousand uh, thousands of signs here. During the recommendations portion of the project, 
department analyzed several different key elements pertaining to new signage along these roadways being proposed by the consultant. It was identified that the department needed to create an internal policy uh, that deals with curve locations with collision rates as well. Um, what happened was the consultant uh, recommended a lot of signs uh, with Caltrans uh, criteria being optional, recommended, or required. Um, they recommended a lot of signs in the optional and recommended criteria. So we have just a, a ton of signs and what happens when you have too many signs is they start to lose their effectiveness. You have sign clutter and then our uh, maintenance crews have an overabundance of signs that they need to maintain. Um, so the implemented departmental policy uh, was incorporated into the project necessitating that the consultant reanalyze uh, all curve locations and provide modified recommendations for sign placement. And with that, I can answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions, board members? See none. Oh, Jennifer. Sorry, I did have uh, two very quick questions. Um, this is 175 miles of county roadway. We have just over 1,000 miles, as I recall, in our inventory. Uh, is this going to be something that we look at other roads on an ongoing basis? Yeah, we're going to probably be um, applying for other HSIP grants in the future to do other uh, sign audit projects, yes. Oh, okay. And then um, are there opportunities um, within this process, um, for example, Forest Hill Road, we had agreed that we would put up some signs that say share the road to remind folks that there's bicyclists on the road. Is there an opportunity within this project to do that sort of work, or is that a separate approach? This is mainly having to do with uh, curve warning signs, school warning signs, um, directional arrows, chevrons, and of that nature. Um, with the bike signs, that would probably be a different project. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, anyone from the public wish to uh, address this item? See none. Bring it back to the board. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Motion carried. Uh, next uh, department item is the Cooperative Fire Protection Agreement with California Department of Forestry. John. Morning, George. Good morning, Chairman, Honorable Board Members. My name is John McEldowney, the Program Manager for Placer County Office of Emergency Services. With me today is Unit Chief George Morris of the Nevada Yuba Placer Unit. Uh, today I'm asking that you adopt a resolution approving the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection Cooperative Fire Protection Agreement, aka the CAL FIRE contract, for fiscal year 2016-17 in the amount of $10,618,000 $375 and authorize the chairman to sign the agreement. By way of background, fire protection in Placer County is provided by 18 independent fire protection districts and by the county itself through a contract with CAL FIRE. CAL FIRE provides fire protection, fire prevention, emergency medical services, hazardous materials, and all hazard incident response in addition to dispatch services. Residents and business of, Placer, of the Placer County fire area contribute directly to year-round all-hazard fire and emergency medical services over approximately 475 square miles of unincorporated county area, or roughly one-third of the county. The area served as a service population of approximately 52,000 people, and fire services provided by both full-time and volunteer firefighters. The CAL FIRE contract currently pays for 60 full-time equivalent firefighters operating from eight fully staffed, 24-hour-a-day fire stations located in Alta, Colfax, Bowman, North Auburn, Ophir, Lincoln, the Sunset Industrial Area, and Dry Creek. Approximately 75 volunteer and resident firefighters operate out of the paid stations listed above and from seven community volunteer stations located in Dutch Flat, Fowler, Page, Ophir, Thermalands, Dry Creek, and Sheridan. Included in the estimated $27 million in county-owned property and equipment are 64 county-owned fire engines, support vehicles, and trailers. The Placer County Fire System provides overhead that supports all paid and volunteer fire stations, 
system overhead includes chief officer coverage 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, fire prevention staff, a heavy equipment mechanic, administration, procurement, communications, and facilities maintenance support. So what do we get for the uh, $10,600,000? During calendar year 2015, Placer County Fire responded to 7,636 calls for service, including 5,493 calls for medical aid. Placer County Fire was also called to uh, 1,474 fire-related calls, including structure and vegetation fires, wildland smoke checks, and debris checks. Additionally, there were 144 hazardous material calls and 531 other types of calls, such as rescues and public assists. In addition, CAL FIRE manages the City of Colfax Volunteer Fire Department and assists the City with its uh, fire inspection and land development functions. These services are fully funded by the City of Colfax in a separate agreement with the County. The CAL FIRE contract, the year-over-year -year contract cost increase of $443,117 represents a 4.4% increase and is due to a combination of restoring two firefighters in the Sunset Station 77 and restoring a third battalion chief in the North Auburn Ophir Fire Zone of Benefit. Both of these better support system-wide response and command and control. The increase is also uh, slightly, uh, part of the increase is slightly due to increased benefit and administrative rates set by CAL FIRE in Sacramento. By way of fiscal impact, the fiscal year 2016-17 proposed budget fully funds the cost of this contract among the following appropriations. Then the County Fire Control Fund, $3,436,632. Within Sunset West Fire, $3,471,901. Within North Auburn Ophir Fire, $2,747,715. And within Dry Creek Fire, uh, $962,127. Uh, this concludes my portion, unless you have any questions. Any questions from the board? I see none. Any comments or questions from the public? It's the pleasure of the board. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the just discussed contract with Cal Fire. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chief. George. Uh, the board will now adjourn to closed session. Jerry. Uh, the board will now adjourn to closed session for a conference with legal counsel to discuss two matters of existing litigation. Rachel Akey versus County and Lori Fu versus County, uh, one workers' compensation case. And the board will also have a conference with its real property negotiators regarding the property listed on the agenda, closed session agenda. Uh, the board has returned back from closed session, and uh, County Council will report out. In closed session, the board had a conference with legal counsel about three uh, existing litigation cases. Rachel Akey versus County of Placer, the board heard a report and gave direction to counsel. In Lori Fu versus County of Placer, the board heard a report and gave direction to counsel. And in David Allen, a workers' compensation claim, the board uh, heard a report and gave direction to counsel. The board also met with its real property negotiators and gave direction to its real property negotiation team. That concludes the closed session report.